Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're reporting from Poland on the cooperative relations between the Polish people and Polish uh, nonprofit organizations and leaders and uh, Ukrainians and how these civil society organizations are navigating the current refugee crisis and some of the other um, uh, issues that um, are hitting uh, Central Europe. And we're, we're pleased to introduce Dr. Uh, Jakob uh, Koskiolak. And, and Jakob, thank you so much for being patient with my poor pronunciation of your name. He is the president of the board of Interkulturani uh, PL. And um, Jakob is going to uh, describe some of the work that he that he has done. Jakob, thank you so much for, for helping us out here to understand your situation and your services. Thank you for uh, the invitation. Thank you. So um, Jakob, could you talk a little bit about the origins of your organization and its services? And, and please uh, switch to Polish. I am sorry that I don't possess the language, but Jan is helping us out. Uh, so please describe how you um, you and your team founded the organization and the services that you provide. Uh, it's, uh, I represent uh, the organization which is called Interkulturalni.pl and we were established in Kraków in the year 2010. And uh, this uh, was triggered by a, the fact that we noticed the need uh, to support migrants, uh, because already back then we saw that there was an increasing number of persons uh, from Ukraine, migrants, uh, who were settling in Kraków, uh, so in our city. And um, we uh, looked at the, at the uh, our aim was to um, tell the city uh, so all the city authorities and, and organizations and institutions uh, that uh, we're talking here about equal citizens who may have some specific needs. Uh, what we did is, uh, is we run some monitoring looking at how exactly the various uh, agencies of the city were uh, coping with um, uh, migrants. Uh, and uh, based on that, we, we made certain um, recommendations. We also run a number of study visits to, to uh, your other European cities to see how they uh, did that. Uh, how, how, and based on that, we developed a plan on how to best uh, integrate um, uh, the migrant citizens into the city. And we were the first, Krakow was the first Polish city to have such a plan. Um, so uh, uh, now it so happens that most of our members are, are members of the academia. They, they are related to, to the to education and higher education and uh, researchers. And we noticed that there was a certain gap in the knowledge of, uh, of how to work with especially uh, children of migrants, how to, um, what to do at schools, how to make the school more uh, international. So right now we are running two um, programs uh, which are, have the aim to integrate kids um, in the mainly in the school, but also in other institutions, and to look at it very holistically. Uh, so, uh, so we are um, developing solutions. We are developing handbooks. Uh, these are addressed at, at uh, also at uh, at the kids, so so Ukrainian and Polish kids, to make um, the the. Uh, institutions uh, that the children are dealing with uh, more international, uh, more open. Culture is a continuum, right? So that culture and a culture is an exchange. It is bi-directional, multi-directional. So I, I think that what you're saying is that this, these influences of history cannot be placed in little buckets with one culture or one group of people or one geography dominating another. And so this, this theory that, uh, that uh, Putin has espoused of a dominant narrative that is owned by a particular group in a particular place, it's, it's not correct. It's really a dialogue in which culture is shared. And I think that the Polish people, the Ukrainian people, and even the Russian people 
if, if instead of trying to dominate one another, we instead do what you're doing, which is to strengthen civil society and figuring out ways to talk with each other, you end up with a better world and, and more prosperity for each of those involved. So we're going to unpack some of your work because I think that your work can be talked about in a crisis sense, but it could also be talked about in a continuum of history. Um, and I really admire what you are doing. Uh, I would I would uh, very much agree with that uh, uh, in the sense that the exchange between Poland and Ukraine has been going on for hundreds of years. In in Kraków, we were organizing an event which was called Following in the Footsteps of Ukrainian uh, writers and artists, because there were quite a number of those who, who worked and lived uh, at least portion of the time in Kraków, and the same goes for Lviv, where there were quite a lot of Polish writers and painters. Uh, with uh, Russians, I am not so sure, because they have lived for centuries in the tradition, uh, in the traditional belief that they are the dominant uh, culture, and uh, their uh, idea is um, to consciously um, disparage or diminish uh, such cultures, which in their opinion, which in their opinion, uh, constitute part of Russia or part of Russian culture, and they've been doing that to you, the Ukrainians for for quite a long time. There was a uh, Russification. This is a, a word that is used uh, um, to express this. For instance, uh, forcing Ukrainians to use the Russian language. And uh, in the 60s, there's this uh, phenomenon which is called the shot generation or executed generation. The, the generation in the 1960s that, that were under pressure not to express um, and Ukrainian identity. Uh, so there is this uh, there is this vision uh, where the Russians believe, um, or there is a nar narrative that is very strong that expresses the belief that uh, Ukraine does not have the right to exist as a cultural identity and does not have the right to exist as a territory. It is perceived from from that point of view uh, from Russia as uh, just part of Russian culture and Russian uh, state. I believe that, that this is a very human thing. And, and what I mean by that is cultural chauvinism, whether it's Europeans to the African nations where Europe colonized the African nations or the colonization of, of the United States uh, by uh, Europeans, or whether it is the Japanese or the uh, the Han Chinese attitudes towards other uh, ethnic groups, we see this constantly in in us, in people, and I think that we, us all, have to understand our tendency toward being chauvinistic to others, and to build bridges like you are doing. Uh, I would say yes, very much so. There were some examples of uh, colonialism, and uh, it has to be uh, said that in the 90s in, in Ukraine, uh, there was, uh, among the writers and thinkers, uh, there was this idea that uh, they would need to perceive Ukrainian uh, culture, Ukrainian country, uh, both as, as post-colonial, really, as post-colonial uh, to the Russian Empire. And um, the writers uh, and, and uh, especially thinkers, uh, intellectuals in Ukraine, very quickly realized that they need to focus on uh, renewing, as it were, the, the Ukrainian identity through culture, among other uh, ways. The, um, the Ukrainians at that time, I'm talking about the 1990s, um, witnessed some support from the West, notably Poland and Germany. Uh, so uh, those who were creative in the areas of literature, for instance, uh, could find some sort of window uh, to the West, some sort of valuation, uh, some sort of uh, place where they could uh, exist uh, outside uh, the, the area of the formerly colonized place. So uh, this was their window to the world. And uh, uh, the, the Russian uh, the culture was very dominant uh, uh, it in Ukraine. It was uh, um, 
uh, it functioned as as you could see the renewal um, very quickly in in cinema and literature. I would back in in early two thousands when I visited. That was before um, this uh, renewal started to gain momentum. I visited uh, uh, Kiev and. Uh, in the capital of Ukraine, it was actually very difficult to find a bookstore that would sell uh, books written in the Ukrainian language. Uh, so uh, so uh, this has changed tremendously right now. And uh, this change uh, was uh, parallel with the shift from, um, it, it's similar to a post-colonial process where uh, the Ukrainians uh, learned to believe uh, that their uh, cultures, because we have the Ukrainians and we have the the rest of the world, but they also uh, kind of were uh, in many ways believing that that their culture was not on a par. And this is when they found out that yes, it is equal as culture. Uh, this is this is uh, the movement that really started in the 1990s. This is uh, you are making a fantastic point, uh, Jakob, because when you look at that in that sense, the, um, the embrace of communication with the West is less about the West and more about finding an equilibrium so that Ukrainians have space to define themselves, isn't it? Uh, uh, the, before I go into details, I'd like to say that the, as we focus on the exchange uh, and the integration, focusing on children, but of course, holistically, so in, we include the, the families that the children are in. But we have to keep in mind that the Ukrainian uh, migrants have been the largest group of migrants in, in Poland for quite some time. And uh, what we have to, we, we had time to think about it, that we need to keep any work with them on equal terms. When uh, the large influx of Ukrainians started and started long ago, and it was mainly young people, there uh, was uh, immediately some fear that that could lead to serious brain drain. Uh, the, that uh, this, so, so it is essential, and we put a lot of emphasis on this, uh, that uh, any, and we have to make everyone aware of that, that it has to be made uh, on equal terms so that uh, uh, we don't have situations where Ukrainians, for instance, have unequal uh, labor relations, that maybe they're paid less. Uh, or, or, and the important thing is that we should integrate and not assimilate. Because uh, if we do not do that, we have to keep it in mind. We have to make sure everyone also at political levels keep that in mind. Because if we don't, we have to let them uh, keep their own voice and uh, let them at all times uh, be able to decide about themselves. Otherwise, if, if we don't, uh, that could lead in the future soon enough to conflicts. Well, again, you're making an excellent point, right? It's shared prosperity. It's shared respect. It's shared strength. You don't wish to extract knowledge and capability from Ukraine. You want to share the knowledge that you have with Ukraine and the knowledge Ukrainians have with you so that there is a balance and mutual prosperity that benefits each other rather than a colonialist uh, attitude, which can result in conflict. You could also have Polish labor becoming very upset with having jobs taken by, um, by Ukrainian labor if there is an imbalance and you are safeguarding against that by assuring that there is no necessarily imbalanced advantage just because somebody is a refugee or somebody is coming from another country. You're finding a way to not only modernize the relationships across borders, but also to um, find a way to productively deal with the realities of migration and trade and exchange. Um, it's, very, it's a very important piece of work that benefits uh, not only um, Ukraine, but also Poland and, and all of Europe. Now with the refugee crisis, it's 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 taken on another complexion. 
When the war broke out, uh, we decided to immediately become involved and we had a certain experience and certain tools to deal with. We have to also keep in mind that Kraków, um, together with Warsaw, were the uh, largest destinations for the influx of, uh, of uh, in this case, refugees from the war. Um, and uh, we uh, decided to do something real and because of the experience we managed to be quite quite effective already uh, uh, on the 24th of february uh, we uh, decided to to establish together with about a dozen other organizations mainly ngos uh, uh, the uh, open krakow coalition which is uh, a, a grouping of organization which is now which has now more than 60 members uh, so so this is this is how it started also, what needs to be noted was that this was a coalition of organizations which were very diverse. So one thing that we managed to successfully do was to very quickly realize who's good at what. We uh, very quickly were able to find out what needs to be done and who would be the best organization uh, to deal with that. So for instance, uh, the moment uh, the moment the, the influx started, uh, we were we were um, responding uh, because this was a tremendous, these are huge numbers of people. Uh, there was very quickly, and uh, we, we organized a response group located at the railway station, Krakow, Maine, which was like the, the main focal point uh, of arrival. Uh, so the very first, uh, the very first, uh, we what we, the way we worked we divided our organizations into subgroups so there was one subgroup which focused on the uh, physical reaction uh, and meeting the arrivals and these were very basic things it was providing accommodation and food uh, another subgroup uh, uh, was focusing on providing psychological assistance another subgroup was focusing on providing legal uh, assistance there was another subgroup which was formed not long ago which was the um, uh, relocation policy. I was, by the way, uh, the coordinator of that subgroup, and this proved to be a very difficult uh, subject to deal with because on the one hand side, there were a number of cities and organizations throughout Europe which declared that they were willing uh, to accept uh, and, and host um, Ukrainian migrants. But from what we've observed, a very large number of the, of the refugees are not willing to relocate. They want to stay uh, close to home, if possible. Um, many of them believe that the conflict is not going to last long. And if so, they would like to return home as quickly as possible. Another uh, set of activities is related to the education because uh, Ukrainian children, uh, which who arrived in, in huge numbers, became part of the Polish educational system. So our activities were then uh, focused on, on improving the way they function within, uh, within that system. Uh, the, 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 us being a grassroots movement um, allowed us to react very fast, but it has to be emphasized that we had at all times good cooperation with the city of Krakow and all of its agencies. Uh, that thanks to fast reaction and to good work uh, with the city authorities, we managed to uh, avoid a, a humanitarian crisis. Um, at the moment huge numbers started arriving, uh, you, you have to, we have to also emphasize that the individual citizens of Krakow played a very significant role because especially early on, they were uh, simply providing uh, shelter to, to migrants, they were accepting them in their homes. And, and it has to be uh, emphasized that, that without the help of individuals, of, of uh, the inhabitants of Krakow, who provided immediate shelter, uh, we wouldn't have been able to, to, to do this. Uh, this is one of the few large scale uh, migrant situations where we managed without uh, building camps uh, as it were, uh, we did have reception points, but the majority, vast majority of the people who arrived found uh, initial uh, place to, to stay uh, in people's homes. So uh, with given the number of total number of people who arrived, all the hostels 
and hotels and and the dormitories would not be enough to to house that many people it's fairly comprehensible to americans krakow's population increased by 10 percent it would be as if in new york our population increased by a million people over you know in a very short period of time the same thing for los angeles or any other american city and we have our own difficulties with migration. It is wholly admirable what has been done. How does, and I know that a lot of this is about volunteering and people uh, uh, spending their own time and even their own money to help others, but you also need some funds to help you coordinate this effort. How does the money work? Where, where are you funded from? Uh, well, initially, uh, th that is all true. Initially, um, no one had any money. It was just volunteers and commitment of, of, of regular people. The, the, the response was tremendous. Uh, the, there were collections, uh, money was collected, things were collected. We had a point uh, at... Uh, like a collection point at one of the largest stadiums in in Krakow, and the uh, the number of or the amount of things that people brought was huge. Nobody expected that. It was actually quite surprising. Uh, well, also also not no one was expecting such an influx of of migrants, but the, the reaction was tremendous. And it was actually possible in the initial period to operate without external funding. Uh, however, uh, I'm a realist and uh, uh, everybody knows that in a situation such as this, there's a crisis, there's tremendous um, interest, there are, there are, the emotions uh, run high and there's a lot of help. But as time goes, uh, the interest will wane and, and there will be uh, less involvement and engagement. So the challenge is how do we continue? And uh, here I have to say that we had, uh, we've had quite a lot of help from international organizations, foundations, uh, either indirectly, so money would be sent to the city of Krakow and the city of Krakow would then redistribute it to NGOs, uh, or some NGOs received um, funding from abroad directly. Uh, so I have to say that the international community reacted quite strongly and very positively. And uh, our organization as such does not collect money, but I know that, uh, that uh, many of our members uh, do have such sources of funding. They receive funding from, from abroad. It is all about human beings responding to human need. And the funding is, is all going to civil society. It's not going to uh, perpetuate uh, war. It's basically to respond to human need. It is very admirable. And I'd like to thank you for sharing your experience with us and to thank also all of the people who are supporting you because your struggle and your contribution is really in as, as a representative for us all. We should all be doing more and perhaps um, can in the future contribute in some small way to your efforts. Thank you so much, Dr. Jakob uh, Koskiolak. Please thank all of your volunteers, all of your funders, your entire network for supporting these people in need. And thank you as an American banking a poll for all the work that you are doing on the behalf of, of civil society. Thank you. Thank you, very much. thank you very much for the invitation. And I will surely uh, pass on your, your thanks to all the volunteers and to all the persons who are involved in this. Uh, for me, I think it's very important, and that follows from the fact that we had this meeting, uh, that there are people who are willing to talk to us about this, uh, who are willing to talk to people who are doing something positive about that. And uh, it's also very important for uh, US citizens to know about this, uh, especially the US citizens, because the US is a country very close to me because I was a Fulbright student in Washington, DC. Well, thank you so much. We can learn from your example and we very much appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Take care. Take care. Thank Bye. you. Bye.